Our next speaker will be Christine Adams, and she will be speaking on the Gallic Singularity and the Royal Mistress. Um, Christine is a professor of history at St. Mary's College of Maryland and uh, has a, also a PhD from John Hopkins in history from 1993. She has two books, the most recent of which is Charity, Poverty, Charity, and Motherhood, Maternal Societies in 19th Century France, published in 2010. And since she has published articles on Madame de Montespan, uh, Belle comme le jour, Beauty, Power, and the King's Mistress in French History, and Madame Tallien, Venus of the Capital, Madame Tallien and the Politics of Beauty under the Directory in French Historical Studies uh, in 2014. Um, as already noted, she and Tracy Adams have edited the book on female beauty systems, which I highly recommend to you, in 2015, and they're working on a book um, called The Creation of the French Royal Mistress, which is, as we said before, under contract to Penn State Press. So, Christine. In a panel that considers the impact of the notion of the Gallic singularity as it applies to women, we must recognize that no figure better represents this singularity under the Ancien Regime than the royal mistress, both to contemporaries and to subsequent scholars fascinated by the role that the French mistress played at court. For example, in February of 1752, Kaunitz Rietberg, the imperial ambassador in Paris, wrote to Baron Ignace de Koch, the Austrian Empress Maria Theresa's secretary, Vous voyez par conséquent que l'État et la façon de penser de la maîtresse du roi est une affaire très sérieuse dans ce pays-ci. While Kaunitz Rietberg was speaking specifically of Madame de Pompadour, he was also indicating that the power the royal mistresses wielded were, was unique to France. Certainly kings in other countries had mistresses. Those of Charles II of England, a contemporary of Louis XIV, were legendary for their beauty and influence at court. But the position that the maîtres en titre had managed to carve out for themselves in France since at least the early 16th century has suggested something unique about the relationship that women were able to forge with powerful men in that country. The Marquis de Fouquier, a contemporary of Louis XIV, frequently lumped together the ministers, and, or the ministers and mistresses of the king as the key political actors at the court. Laurent Angleville de la Beaumelle, biographer and author of a forged memoir of Madame de Maintenon, argued that En France, le maîtresse d'un roi est presque nécessairement un ministre d'État. The mistress of the king is almost necessarily a minister of state. The French royal mistress was far more than sexual partner to the king. No one would have reduced the powerful maîtresse en titre to that. She was a central, extremely powerful actor at the court, and she was the king's most valued friend and advisor. This required, as Tracy suggested in her presentation, a belief that while women might have been legally and socially inferior to men, that they were intellectually fully capable of serving as worthy counselors to the king. Karen was, was kind enough to share with me parts of the draft of her important book on the woman question in France, 1400 to 1870, coming soon from Cambridge University Press, and forcefully makes the point that, in the 19th century in particular, male cultural critics in France celebrated the influence of women on morals and civilization in a way that few other world cultures do. This unequal but agreeable relationship between the sexes has served as the basis of the perceived Gallic singularity that lies at the heart of the historiography of the French royal mistress. That there is something quintessentially French about the mistress and the role she played in the court, and that she represents, in a sense, the civilizing role that women played in French society more generally. Whitney's paper will demonstrate how that ideal of the distinctive French role women, French women could play persisted into the 19th and 20th centuries, in some, in some cases complicating the attraction of feminism for women. Clearly, Arved Barine drew on this concept in her own work on 17th century women, as we will see. Problematic, as Mono Zouf's benign, benign analysis of the French denial of citizen rights to women in the wake of the French Revolution of 1789 and 1848 is, as well as her tendentious critique of American feminism, a wide variety of sources support Ozouf's other contention that there was something unique about the role of French women under the Ancien Regime, especially the king's mistress, something that observers as diverse as Montesquieu, David Hume, who called France a country of women, and Mary Wollstonecraft recognized. 
Jean's discussion of Alexis de Tocqueville indicates that he also preferred the French system of relations among the sexes, especially in comparison with American, at least in his earlier private writings, although it will show his views on sex-gender relations are ultimately rather ambiguous. Ozouf, not surprisingly, also draws on Tocqueville's complicated views on the sexes. But all these commentators, well, well, Tocqueville's a little more opaque, perhaps, they believed that women were essential to the intellectual and moral harmony that undergirded civilized French society. In a monarchy in which, as Ozouf points out, collective male participation in the state is unnecessary, women and men can collaborate in the project of shaping society, and I would argue the polity. In fact, in a book that Tracy are currently working on, we argue that the role of the royal mistress was a central element in the rise of the French state in the early modern era, a state founded in part on the doctrine of dissimulation, supported by the developing doctrine of secrecy as central to state security. In this context, the mistress secretly worked her influence by pretending to be merely the king's lover, a status no one would have found objectionable as long as she was reasonably discreet and had another plausible role at the court. It was, in contrast, her status as political advisor that was potentially more objectionable. As long as her political influence remained veiled, cloaked by her role as cultural icon and arbiter at the court, and enhanced by her erotic role as the king's lover, although that was never, never so as visible as we might think, she could exercise it with the tacit knowledge of courtiers and foreign visitors to the court who made use of her as intermediary and patron. As Michel Saad writes, quote, the few who attained the position of mistress succeeded in creating this ambiguous representation of female power conveyed by the history of the royal concubines. They fascinated the popular imagination and took an exemplary position in the system of symbolic values. They helped to substantiate this cliché that in France, women exert a mysterious influence which is all the more powerful because it is impossible to measure." End quote. Like the male favorites and the female regents who also emerged as important political figures during this period of transition in the late medieval, early modern era, the mistress served as gatekeeper to the king. So, in the royal mistress, we see many of the attributes that observers have long recognized in French women and their relationship to men writ large. First of all, their beauty. The celebration of the beauty and style of all royal mistresses, but especially on Yassarel, Diane de Poitiers, Gabrielle d'Estrée, Madame de Montespan, and Madame du Barry, cemented the image of French women as especially gorgeous and fashionable, another image of Gallic singularity that endures to the present day, certainly. Second, their charm, grace, emotional intelligence, and cultivation, which dates back to the 16th century at least. This made women particularly skillful at managing men and relationships. Anne Boleyn, the second wife of the English King Henry VIII, was raised in the French court and recognized for her excellent French manners. Anne would perhaps have been better off as mistress rather than wife. <laughs> Madame de Maintenon was well known for her ability to please, her tact, and her psychological insight, while the astuteness and ability of the Marquise de Pompadour to entertain Louis XV was at the root of her longevity as the official mistress, even after their sexual relationship ended. Third, their talent, their wit and their talent for excellent conversation, honed in the salons in which many women participated before ascending to their position as mistress to the king. Montespan cultivated the already celebrated esprit mottement in the salon of Marchal d'Albray, and she used her wit to draw Louis XIV's attention away from the more boring Louise de la Valliere. There also, she encountered the woman who would supplant her, Madame Scarron, later Maintenon. And fourth, their intelligence and ability to advise the king on important matters, including political issues. Diane de Poitiers was widely, although quietly, recognized as Henry II's most important political advisor, while Gabrielle d'Estrée played a similar role for Henry IV. We have evidence that councils of war were sometimes held in Montespan's chambers. Colbert's son, the Marquis de Seignelay, reported that Louvois and Louis met him in Montespan's rooms to discuss military affairs involving the war with the Dutch. During the same campaign, the imperial envoy to the Duchess States General, Franz Paul von Lisola, reported to the imperial chancellor that Spanish troops had intercepted several of Louis' couriers on their way to Paris and read four letters addressed to Montespan, quote, in which extremely flattering love speeches alternated with detailed reports on the progress of the siege of Maastricht, like a report for a high officer, end quote. Most historians believe that Madame de Pompadour eventually replaced the Cardinal Fleury as Louis XV's most important political advisor and was essential as mediator in the diplomacy leading up to the renversement des alliances that preceded the Seven Years' War. So, how has this complex and seemingly unique status of the French royal mistress played into the historiography of these women and contributed to our understanding of the Gallic singularity? Certainly the royal mistress represented that uniquely harmonious relationship between French men and women undergirded by the galanterie and conversation that Tracy made reference to. 
superficially unequal, but also embodying a kind of superiority and outsized influence of women to which 19th century scholars of the old regime, such as the Goncourt brothers, drew attention. I don't have time here to list all the 19th century authors who describe French women's power and influence, but Karen's forthcoming book does a masterful job of chronicling that tradition. This complex legacy of royal mistresses left 19th and 20th century historians in a difficult position. How to analyze their roles? These were clearly women who exercised power, but the gendered vision of women that dominated in the post-revolutionary era and into the 20th century as culturally influential but too dangerous to allow political influence made it impossible to recognize their political machinations as useful or productive. So, two lines of attack. Either these women didn't really exercise true political power, in this reading, wise kings such as Louis XIV firmly restricted the influence of favorites such as Montespan to meaningless frivolities at court. For example, Hugh Noel Williams, writing in 1903, argued that, quote, one must in justice to him remember that Louis XIV never permitted his mistresses whatever influences they may have acquired over his heart to have any over his government, end quote. Or, on the other hand, if forced to acknowledge these women wielded political influence, historians sharply criticized it as profoundly misguided and directed by essential and destructive feminine qualities. Hence, the vicious attack on Madame de Pompadour by 19th century author Auguste Dietrich, appalled by her role in promoting the alliance with Austria in 1756. He writes, Madame de Pompadour broke abruptly with this traditional policy, the containment of the Habsburgs. Because of her feminine self-love, because of her ambition to inaugurate a new state of affairs, because of an excessive deference to and poor understanding of the views of Maria Theresa and her minister, the cunning and unscrupulous Kaunitz, who flattered both, the favorite threw herself with the usual enthusiasm of women into an extremely serious situation which she did not really understand. Well, excuse me. We know the results. For France, the legendary defeats of Rosbach and Krefeld, the loss of her colonies in Indian America, the death of 300,000 men, financial disaster by the end of the century, for Germany, the annihilation of entire lineages, for Europe, two billion livres wasted and nearly a million men killed. These are the fruits of the noble marquis's interference in the political sphere. All her fault, clearly. So, these conflicting attitudes about womanhood more generally led to ways of thinking about the royal mistress that were often contradictory. That they were influential as women in the spheres of culture suited to their nature and thus essentially positive in their civilizing effects. Or, they were frivolous by nature, but in a typically feminine way and thus harmless or at least innocent. Or, that they were too ready to meddle in politics where they didn't belong and were thus dangerous. In this formulation, the culture and philanthropic contributions of the French royal mistress could be admired because, because these contribute to civilization and harmony in the manner that Ozouf celebrates. Her greedy focus on clothes and jewelry could be mocked, but ultimately forgiven since that is part of feminine nature. However, her desire for political influence had to be condemned because this allowed her inappropriate access to the political sphere and because she was fundamentally unsuited to that role. And mistresses who de demonstrated too much political ambition also face disapprobation for demonstrating this unattractively masculine trait. Thus, the self-effacing Louise de la Valliere, Louis XIV's first mistress, merits, merits praise for her self-abnegation, but is ultimately not very interesting. The grasping Montespan becomes a villainous in the eyes of writers such as the sketchy Quentin Crawford, but others praise her style and patronage of the arts. August Dietrich, in addition to the attacks on her political acumen, slashes Pompadour, who, beneath a beautiful exterior, hid a cold, dry soul and demonstrated unfeminine ambition, while Dubarry, whose major flaw was typically ex feminine extravagance, quote, of all Louis XV's known mistresses, certainly remains the most affable and kindest of them all, end quote. In this one author, we see what Karen, among others, has highlighted in her work, the simultaneous celebration and denigration of women. For me, a historian of the 21st century, there's little interest in judging these women as inappropriately masculine in their aspirations, feminine in their flaws, or even as the embodiment of the French singularity that Ozouf celebrates. In our work, Tracy and I have chosen to focus on the historical context that gave rise to the special position of the royal mistress in France, the theatrical nature of the court that allowed her to simultaneously dazzle courtiers and observers from afar while veiling her political influence and the interconnections between her collapse and that of the French monarchy. We would argue that the ambiguous nature of the mistress meant that, even though many feared and disliked individual mistresses, others could celebrate her role as mediator and cultural icon. Their very real political power and their centrality in the rise of the French state were masked by that sociability, that cultural contribution, that civilizing feminine influence for which contemporaries and subsequent writers praised them. 
But this balancing act became more difficult to maintain as France, France gradually moved into the age of modern politics. Even as the sexual and political position of the royal mistress, a position whose ambiguity had been carefully maintained over the centuries became more visible at court, it was also becoming more visible to the larger public. Here again, we must emphasize Madame de Pompadour, a woman whose political influence ambassadors, courtiers, and the French people at large acknowledged by the 1750s. The new demand for transparency and accountability on the part of government officials that undergirded the Age of Enlightenment led to increased interest in and discussion of the machinations of the court to which mistresses such as Pompadour and later Dubarry were central. In some ways, the reign of Pompadour followed by Dubarry calls to mind Karl Marx's famous dictum that all great world historic facts and personages appear, so to speak, twice, the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce. The details of their sexual relations with the king, especially in the case of Dubarry, were the stuff of Libel, the Libel of which Robert Darton has written in such detail. Their political intriguing caused outrage among the public, especially as Pompadour was revealed as the driving force behind the Austrian alliance that ensnared the French in the disastrous Seven Years' War. And many saw Dubarry's handiwork in the fall of Choiseul and the attacks on the Parlement in the 1770s. The sudden prominence of the royal mistress revealed in print and gossip turned both Pompadour and Dubarry into objects of hatred, focal points for the discontent that was brewing in France by the second half of the 18th century. Dubarry was the last official royal mistress. Louis XVI relied instead on his wife, Marie Antoinette, who became the target of hatred as intense as any that came the way of Pompadour or Dubarry. Carolyn Harris argues in a recent book that Marie Antoinette, in fact, filled the role of both consort and mistress to Louis XVI at great cost to her reputation. In the end, she and Dubarry, of course, shared the same fate, the guillotine. That ambiguous role has made it very difficult for historians to slot Marie Antoinette. Was she reviled because she represented all queens? Was she reviled because she embodied all women in a newly misogynistic polity? One thing she did not represent, at least to most observers, the Gallic singularity. She lived and died as l'Autrichienne, the Austrian bitch. So. <laughs> <laughs>